Welcome to the number one show and the source of truth for all things medtech. Here, we reveal the secrets and stories behind the investments, science, and commercialization of the medtech industry. Every week, we'll take you on a wild ride with the biggest names in the game, from entrepreneurs and investors who are shaking up the market, to healthcare providers who are revolutionizing the way we think and practice medicine. So hold on tight and get ready for a journey like no other. This is the State of MedTech. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. And, you know, I just kind of realized just by coincidence, you know, it's kind of like uh, with the content, sometimes things line up in a very interesting way. This is a con med week. You know, on Monday, we had Aaron Chester on. Today, today's, uh, you know, episode, it's about exits. You know, I love interviewing founders who have a successful exit. Coincidentally, this exit was to con med. Um, <laughs> like I'm, I'm kind of like uh, uh, laughing right now because my my creative director had no idea, but this is how he lined it up, and I agreed with it, and I just realized that. But anyways, today's uh, guest is Kevin Rocco, who currently is the VP of Inductive Technologies over at ConMed Corp. Which, by the way, interesting tidbit about ConMed: ConMed is actually an abbreviation for Consolidated Medical. Right, which makes sense in terms of their acquisition strategy. BioRes was a great acquisition. So uh, in 2022, ConMed uh, officially acquired BioRes, okay, in a cash-free, debt-free basis for cash considerations of about 85 million at closing, okay, which is subject to adjustment. But then also an additional 165 million dollars in growth-based earnouts payment over a four-year period. It was a great acquisition for them, a uh, great success story. And so Biores it was a medical device startup that was based in New Haven, Connecticut, focused on advancing the healing of soft tissue using its proprietary BioBrace, which is a great name, BioBrace implant technology. So the BioBrace implant is an innovative bioinductive scaffold that is intended to reinforce soft tissue where weakness exists and facilitates healing. Um, you know, one area that you've seen it being used a lot is in sports medicine, specifically, I think with ACL and MCL uh, 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 tears. You know, and I got to tell you, like, of products I've seen online, this is the one that I've seen so many surgeons post about in the orthopedic space. They just love this product. But even better than the product is Kevin Rocco and his story. So Kevin Rocco, I've met him through the LSI uh, meeting, which, by the way, if you're a founder and you have not signed up for LSI 2024, I'm just going to tell you, best piece of advice I'm going to give you, and I advise a lot of startups, go immediately and sign up for LSI 2024 Sign up to be a speaker because they have limited spots. It'll be the best investment you make your entire year if you're a founder raising a seed uh, round, series A, B, or C. Uh, LSI uh, is not a meeting that's nice to attend. You must attend it, okay? So shout out to LSI. Definitely go check that out. But getting back to Kevin, we met at LSI. Incredibly thoughtful guy, humble, and more importantly, I love his story as a founder because what's rare is that he's a technical founder, meaning that he came out, you know, he has a, a, a degree in, in biomedical engineering. So he was the technical founder of BioBrace, but then also molded himself and merged into the role of CEO and did it successfully. And I think when you listen to this episode, you're going to realize that part of that is that he was hyper aware of where he had some gaps in his leadership and his uh, executive uh, executive skills and seeked out help from the board and others. It's a great story and, and I, I can't speak highly enough of Kevin. So that is gonna be our episode today. And before we do, we're gonna do a quick little roll through of some of our sponsors. We got some exciting ones for you. So tune in and here we go and we'll get through them quick. Now, a couple things I want to make sure to plug. Number one is if you are an organization who is using Salesforce, okay, we all know how much of a pain Salesforce is, and it's a huge investment. Why not protect that investment and get the most out of it? That's where Clary comes into play. Clary is a sponsor of our show, and Clary essentially is a revenue intelligence platform. What does that mean? Well, that means that Clary plugs into Salesforce and does a couple things. Number one, it automates the data going into Salesforce for your reps. So first off, 
Think about how much time a rep has. You want to add to that plate them entering data into Salesforce. Even if they get it done, they usually do it after hours or on the weekends. And so the data isn't as clear. So as they say, garbage in, garbage out. Well, Clary automates that so it's super easy for reps to get their data in. The second thing, and this is where Clary's category, which is revenue, collaboration, and governance comes into play. Clary takes those insights and gives it back to you as the sales manager, the director, the VP, so that you understand what are the deals that are most important, which deals need to be touched again and managed more closely and get the more resources. And the best part is that when it comes to revenue collaboration and governance, this is a team sport. So through Clary, this allows the sales organization and the marketing organization to work side by side instead of against each other to figure out which deals can we close this quarter? And that's where the true value of Clary comes out, which is for your board, for your executive team, they help you predict revenue. They are so good at this, it's like magic. I, you know, One of their big case studies was a company that I did something about $5 billion in revenue annually, something in the billions. And they were able to predict revenue quarters ahead of time and be within only 100k of difference like that level of accuracy is insane so to learn more about clary you can click the show notes below and go read you know that's our life sciences landing page for medtech or just go to clary.com that's c-l-a-r-i.com to learn more now a couple other things i want to make sure to plug because i think you know i always want to provide value to the audience beyond just the content if you are looking for early adopters, we all know how difficult it is to find those early adopters, right? We, it's not always the person who's up on podium or even somebody who is you know, the most published, right? Those early adopters that really open up a market are the ones that you don't know about, right? So how do you find them? Well, data can be your best friend. The problem is twofold. Number one, a lot of these providers who have these great databases of surgeons and clinicians in terms of their prescribing behavior, who's prescribing procedure volume is the highest, who gets paid what and by whom, so on and so forth, they cost a lot of money, tens of thousands of dollars every year. But then the other side of it is these databases aren't exactly easy to use. It's not like you can hand this to your sales force and they're going to use it, right? That's why I've partnered up with Alpha Sophia. Alpha Sophia is a sales operations and intelligence platform that essentially anybody can use, even associate reps, right? Because it's so straightforward and easy to use. Plus, they integrate all kinds of data points that you don't find out everywhere else. Like who, you know, of the surgeons that say you're looking for a procedure who has high procedure volume, how, which ones have a LinkedIn profile? Which one has a Twitter handle? Which one uses Instagram? And they bring all that data into play. And so if that wasn't great enough already, their price to use is so incredible. I wish that this existed when I was a rep. It only costs $300 a month. And so you can try Alpha Sophia for free right now. Check the show notes below or go to alphasophia.com forward slash Omar. You'll see my picture there because this is a special offer just for this audience. You get not one, not two, but three searches for free where they're going to give you a report on anything you want just for you to see and use the platform. And then if you decide to use them, hey, it's only 300 bucks a month. That's something everybody can afford. And last but not least, if you are a sales leader and you realize how difficult it is to drive product adoption and actually sell these days, if you believe in your reps, invest in them. You know, there's this old saying that goes like, hey, what happens if we invest in everybody and they leave? Well, the other side of it is like, well, what if you don't invest in them and they all stay, right? You can't have a stale sales force that does not know how to sell in the digital age. That's why I created the Medical Sales Network Effects Program to help sales reps, VPs, and even CEOs learn how do you use LinkedIn and social media to actually sell and drive product adoption? How do you use email and video sales letters to create engaging content that's going to actually get emails opened up. I teach all that and more inside of my program. Plus, I even offer specifically tailored one-on-one -on -one trainings just for sales teams who go through it. So if that's not enough, here's what one sales rep had to say about the program and the result that this guy got literally within a few weeks of starting the program. I tried to reach out to this one surgeon. I posted recently on LinkedIn about launching a bunch of new products in this year, in 2023. He accepted my connection request liked that comment and two days later booked a case with this new technology that we had showed him two days later or two days prior. So it was like all like 
a methodical step. So in the surgery yesterday it went pretty well. He agreed to try it again. Um, so I think from our standpoint, it was a it was a win-win-win of getting the connection on LinkedIn to seeing our content, having a good inner office meeting from a standpoint of being able to talk with the surgeon about the new technology and what his peer was doing, and then having a successful case where he would want to use the product again. Now let's get on to our episode. Enjoy. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. Uh, joined by a good friend of mine, somebody that I got to know from the iconic, dare I can't call it legendary LSI uh, in Emerging MedTech Summit. They got their Barcelona event coming up soon, which he will be at. And I'm not going because I you know, got to stick back for the family. And for the second year in a row, I got FOMO. Big shout out to Scott Pantel because again, I really want to be there, but I'll definitely be at LSI 2024. If you're a founder and you haven't signed up for that, you got to sign up for that. So my guest today is Kevin Ronco. Kevin Ronco is the founder and CEO of BioRes, which exited to ConMed. But just as interestingly enough, he's also the inventor of the technology BioBrace. And so I wanted to have him on because one, it's rare to find a technical founder who invents a you know, device or medical technology, starts the company, but then shepherds it through its commercial phase into its exit. Usually there's a change. And so Kevin, you're kind of a, you're like this rare gem of a unicorn. So we had to have you on. How are you doing? Thanks, Omar. Thanks. It's great to be on. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. You know, I got to say, uh, you know, I, I, I love talking to founders. Um, I'm, I'm a startup guy. And so it's, it's like very near and dear to my heart. But you know, the moment that I said, you know, I like this Kevin Rocco guy. It wasn't when BioRes exited to ComEd. It was not, you know, when you guys hit your, your FDA clearance or anything. It was specifically at uh, 2.30 in the morning. Actually, it's probably close to 3 in the morning at LSI where people, you know, at the LSI conference, people are having a blast. They're talking about their startups and, you know, all kinds of, you know, ideas are flying around. And usually the after hours are just as exciting because everybody goes to the bar. It's just like it's so much fun. But at some point, the bar, bar shuts down and people are like, oh, man, this sucks. And then out of the blue, here you come in, falling <laughs> out of control. I don't know how you got a cart. There was like a, like a silver, tr you know, tray. You had like champagne, beers, snacks and everything. And like three in the morning at, at, at the, at the Waldorf. And I'm like, this guy is my kind of guy. <laughs> we need more guys like this in our industry. So, um, yeah. So like, you know, that doesn't surprise me because like, if you're able to pull that off at the Waldorf, like you're able to pull all kinds of startup, uh, magic off. So, you know, maybe the first, a great place to start is like, who is Kevin Rockwell for the audience that does not know us? Like, where are you from? Where'd you grow up? You know, who were you before that, that the is, man that I met at three in the morning at the Waldorf? <laughs> that is, that is hilarious. Well, trust an entrepreneur to find a way uh, to keep everything, you know, going in the right direction. So that was a, uh, that was a great meeting. Um, so my background, I mean, I'm a biomedical engineer by training, studied at the University of Connecticut, um, Connecticut born and bred. I started my career at Covidian, now Medtronic, in North Haven, Connecticut. I was a new technology, uh, essentially development engineer. And <clears throat> it was through soft tissue research, I would say, working for Covidian, looking at absorbable sutures and hernia mesh that I started to learn about regenerative medicine. And I started to feel, this is kind of 2009, 2010, that, that tissue engineering and regenerative medicine was going to be my generation's big opportunity. And so I wanted to learn a lot more about that. And I um, quit my job and I went to Yale to study under Chris Brewer and Toshi Shinoka, who had a, a world-class lab studying that specifically. So that was kind of my, maybe my quick origin story from an engineering and science and technology standpoint. But I think also in parallel, I've always been a little bit of an entrepreneur and, and business minded as well. Nice. That's fantastic. Was it, you know, um, cause getting, going and working for, for companies. So you're at Covidian. So essentially you were there during the acquisition that, that iconic acquisition that Medtronic made it was like 48 million in cash. You know, so when you're in a place like that, it's kind of hard to leave. Um, was it difficult for you to kind of decide to go back to school? Yeah. For me, it was, it was relatively easy. I, I thought, um, I wanted to be uh, on the cutting edge of where, uh, new technology was really, you know, at that cutting edge, kind of like the space race, moon race, uh, edge of the line of what's knowable and what's unknown. And I realized that I wasn't quite qualified enough uh, to do that 
with just kind of a bachelor's degree. And also, you know, that wasn't particularly the right opportunity for me to do that. Um, I think, I think U.S. Surgical, which is the site I was at, which became Tyco, which became Covidian, which became Medtronic, has a storied, amazing history, and they do a lot of important work. But I was really trying to push towards that tissue engineering, uh, which was really only in academia at the time. It, it hadn't really made its way to industry yet. Got it. Got it. And that's a very interesting, you know, U.S. Surgical is such an iconic place. And it's, it's something that's rare that a lot of people don't know about is that that evolution, which is it was you. I think you said it correctly, which was like uh, U.S. Surgical, Tyco, Covidian, and then acquired by Medtronic, right? Correct. Yeah. So, and I saw like so after you did your uh, your research at Yale, you were the director for ops and development uh, for soft tissue generation. And so you sp essentially focus on soft tissue generation for uh, the a ACL ligament. Correct. Can you tell us a little bit about that. Like how yeah. when you went to Yale, did you have an idea? of of what you're going to focus on or how, how what was the genesis of that yeah so everybody out there that's thinking about maybe joining a startup this is kind of my how i got into the startup world story and coming out of yale i knew i wanted to get back into industry i had only previously worked at covidian which is a forty five thousand. it was a forty five thousand employee organization you know acquired for like whatever 45 48 billion dollars so it was very very large I knew I wanted to get into a smaller company, maybe a more innovative company, maybe a startup. Um, and then it just happened that a recruiter came to me with an opportunity to be the second full-time employee of a, of a startup. So, you know, my title was, you know, whatever director of operations or something, but really I just I sort of did everything the CEO didn't or could delegate to me. And so it was really a crash course in all things startup. And I never intended to be that early on a startup, but it was just the right opportunity given what I was studying. And this was a company, Soft Tissue Regeneration, had a tissue graft. They had a scaffold to replace an ACL tissue graft. And they were actually launching it in a first in human safety study. So it was going clinical. It was getting ready for prime time. And we we're going to try to figure out, you know, does this thing really work? And could we replace tissue grafts in ACL reconstruction, which I think is a bit of a holy grail that I think in my lifetime, in our lifetime, we will we will see that happen. Got it. Got it. So tell us a little bit about the like the genesis of of BioRes, right? What what how did how did that how did you pull that all together? And again, just for context to kind of cut to the to the punchline. So BioRes, the the yeah. flagship uh product was BioBrace. So that was a bioinductive scaffold that is that was intended to reinforce soft tissue where weaknesses exist. And then facilitate soft tissue healing. And then it was cleared by the FDA in May, April of 2021, had seven patents. And then in 2022, ConMed acquired BioRes uh, for a deal valued about 250 mil. So pretty, pretty great story. Five years in, quarter of a billion dollar exit. Um, and by the way, a, a phenomenal product because that's the other thing that I noticed was that surgeons really love this product. And I don't say that lightly. Like, I mean, I see Scott Sigmund, other orthopedic surgeons. A post about it. Actually, I gotta, I gotta go here because it'll make you happy. I need to go to Instagram and tell you what Scott Sig Scott Sigmund had something on his story about uh, BioBrace today. What was it? Yeah, so he has, so he has a, uh, he has a picture of of BioRes and, and ACL. And says, "How about a sweet quad ACL with a BioBrace augment? You know, you want one." So, like, you know, it kind of speaks for itself. Like, it's pretty impressive to see orthopedic surgeons who are normally, I mean they adopt a lot of cool tech. So there's a lot of competition, but they don't usually post like that. And I've seen multiple tools like that. So how do you, what was the genesis, no. genesis of the company and how do you get, get to a point of having a product that great? Well, big thanks to great surgeons like Scott Sigmund outside of Boston. I mean, he's a phenomenal surgeon, a great person. And he has an amazing kind of online presence on LinkedIn, uh, Instagram. You pull up Instagram. He sent me a TikTok. I was like, I'm not even on TikTok. So he crushes, uh, man. He's, he's Hit really... Him, yeah, and he's, he's <laughs> him and Corey Pound. Him and Corey. And for um, those, if you're, if you're, by the way, if you're in the ortho world, like you should absolutely be subscribed to the ortho show and you should, you know, subscribe to that show. Give it five stars, right? Review. It's the best show, best show in orthopedics. Uh, but sorry, go, go ahead, right, Kevin. Yeah, no. And so um, look how I ended up starting BioRes is, is a pretty simple story. I was the second full-time employee of a startup that uh, ran out of money and we had a clinical trial where a couple of patients retore their ACL graft between 12 and 24 months and very hard to get financing to continue that project forward with an uncertain clinical 
efficacy. Now the study was just safety, it wasn't powered for efficacy, but essentially the company fell apart. And so I became convinced that I had seen enough that something was there. There was an opportunity to, you know, augment the healing process and, and develop a scaffold for the sports medicine market. And historically, you know, this is now called 2016, pretty much all materials that a surgeon could use to rebuild soft tissue were either suture or textile material, or they were tissue grafts. And there was kind of nothing in between. So surgeons are trying to rebuild and repair what the patient has or replace it all together with a tissue graft. And I just thought that there was an opportunity to rationally design and engineer a material that had the right properties that could um, act as a scaffold to both accelerate healing, uh, but also mechanically reinforce. And that was, that was the, that was the vision. Um, and when we restarted the company in 2016, uh, it was with the support of some of the investors that were in soft tissue regeneration. So they had gotten to know me and they helped me sort of found that in 2016. Now, full disclosure, we actually started the company to do a version two of an ACL graft replacement. So actually I didn't have BioBrace invented. Um, we didn't actually plan to do an augment. Our plan was to do an, a graft for ACL reconstruction. And about a year and a half in, we did a major pivot towards the BioBrace, what became the BioBrace today. So that's really impressive because when we talk, when you hear about pivots and startups, um, you know, a lot of times they could be great, but what you don't hear is that most of the time when people pivot, they pivot into the wrong thing and bankrupt the company. What specifically happened that made you say we need to pivot and how did you pivot in that direction that gave you a, again, quarter of a bill exit? Yeah, very, very scary. I mean, to be very candid, I mean, I probably almost lost my job by proposing a pivot. You know, we had restarted the company. We spent a year and a half trying to develop this improved ACL graft. We had, by all measures, improved that graft, filed new intellectual property, had done some survival animal studies. Things were looking good. But unbeknownst to any of our investors, we actually had a side project, kind of back burner project, where we were trying to develop a new type of scaffold from the ground up, not trying to improve any prior technology. We were just trying to go blank, blank slate, what we could actually build if we weren't constrained by anything. And we had an engineering breakthrough and the team at that point was growing. It was strong. It was early, but we came up with something that, you know, when we look back at it, it was like, wow, this is actually better than the main thing. And so, <clears throat> and better as measured by its mechanical properties, its porosity, its biologic material with the collagen in it. We can talk a little bit about that. You know, historically things were biologic or synthetic. This was a composite material of both collagen and PLLA resorbable fibers. And we just really, really liked it. And the other part that really, I think, kicked it over the edge of why not just, why is it better from a scientific standpoint, but why is it a better business is uh, we could bring it to market through the FDA with a 510K and not a PMA. And so it actually brought in our regulatory timeline by many years and by many tens of millions of dollars. And where we landed with it is, I think from a, a salesperson's perspective, it's much easier to sell a device that is going to augment what a surgeon is already doing and making it better than it is to replace what they like doing. And so for us, this was a way to bring something to market faster for less money with less regulatory risk that is also more likely to sell. So it just seemed like a no brainer. Yeah. And that's such a great point, which is um, it's, it's so much better. It's almost like when you come up with a product, you want to come up with something that's uh, not just better or an incremental like improvement, but like a radically different thing, right? Because the adoption will be better. It's easier to market and sell and everything. But then on the on the adoption side of it, you want something that just like kind of uh, segues into like existing workflow and everything. Because like it's almost like yeah. you want a really radically different product, but you don't want it to be radically different in terms of how it's adopted. You know, and I think that's what makes medical device like and biotech and medtech so difficult, right? And so you guys kind of like Super threaded hard. the needle on that really well. Can you Super talk? Hard. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, and I was just going to say, and, and and kind of the other part is, you know, you have to you have to position it where it provides value for all the stakeholders. And that's, you know, obviously the surgeon, it's, it's the patient, it's, you know, the hospital, it's the insurer, the payer. Um, it's also even the, you know, the rep and the commercial team. I mean, everybody has to kind of want it to go and it's really hard to get alignment with, you know, five plus parties on anything. A hundred percent. And I'm so happy you mentioned that too. Cause again, this is why like, 
the game that we're in right now, like I, I kind of laugh when I look at like tech sales and software sales. I'm like, guys, like get out of here with that. Like, it's like, that's not a hard job. Um, you, you mentioned something earlier and I want you to kind of dive into it, not just for some of the sure. uh, reps who follow, but more specific clinicians. You talked about like a uh, 510k versus a PMA and what you guys decided to do. Can you explain what that means and why you chose one over the other? Yeah. So, so the most basic way to look at it is a 510k pathway with the FDA um, is, is almost a cheat code. It's, it's saying that there is a device on the market that is similar enough, a predicate that's out there that we're just going to make a tweak based on that predicate. And because of that, it doesn't have to undergo extensive clinical studies. And so it makes sense because listen, if you had, if you had a screw of five millimeters and you want to release a screw of six millimeters, um, you know, it's very hard to do clinical studies to just make iterative changes. So we also thread the, the needle, by the way, on making changes that were meaningful enough, but also not so dissimilar to a predicate on the market. And that's where we took one step forward so we could still tie into the 510K pathway, establish a predicate and get to market without a clinical trial. Um, <clears throat> the converse of that with the FDA would be a PMA where, you know, you're doing a full clinical study to prove um, typically safety and efficacy. Got it. Got it. And so essentially you guys went the 510K route, correct? Co correct. And we, we were careful to use materials that were known to the FDA that were um, they had a known safety profile. So we sort of checked the safety box. And then as again, as an augment and as a um, iteration on a predicate, uh, the FDA deems that kind of safe enough to let the market decide to let the clinicians decide, you know, is this device going to prove to have value, utility, efficacy, etc. Um, one other just interesting piece of information, I don't know if you've, you've known this, but to any entrepreneurs out there, the irony in getting to market quicker is that you actually have to spend a lot more money on the commercialization stage than you would otherwise have to spend doing clinical trials. And so Silicon Valley Bank has done um, a tremendous amount of research on medical device startups. And I found it very interesting that a 510k pathway company typically spends more money and takes longer to exit than a PMA company. So for people that know what that means, it's very interesting. Uh, we just happened to we just happened to get through uh, kind of the best of both worlds. Yeah. Well, so I, I, that's that's I'm I'm happy you mentioned that, and I think part of it is that when you do PMA, um, it's a longer route, but then you have like you have sort of a, like a patent cliff, and you it's just you have a much more unique device, and so you know uh, an acquirer is more likely to say like we should just acquire that versus a five ten k route. You know, there's a totally. lot of people who. And this is, you know, this is kind of like my critique of med tech companies is that they go the 510k route uh, to save money, which is fine. I'm, I'm all about that. But then when they commercialize, they're so tight pocketed. And it's like, and you know, um, it's kind of like, like in the world of e-com and SaaS and, and just products, it's like, okay, if it costs, you know, I don't know, you, you sell something that's a hundred bucks. You know, you should be willing to spend up to 50 bucks, 80 bucks even to acquire customers in the beginning. Maybe you even go in the negative. And so for a lot of these med device companies where your, you know, your margins are a little bit better and you're making th tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, you run like a thousand dollar social media campaign. They're like, oh, this was really bad. Like we, we're gonna just, we're just going to cut this. I'm like, you know, so this idea of like acquisition costs and, and everything is just like, like, I don't know where they want to spend the money. I think this is where the, the industry gets lazy and says, hey, let's just hire like really expensive sales reps. And then they'll, they have the relationships, which worked like 10 years ago, but just not the case anymore. Well, what did you guys end up doing for commercialization plan? Well, well, look, I mean, um, if you have a PMA and you've run a clinical trial and you show that your device is better than standard of care, you know, you have a strong leg to stand on to go out commercially. And like you mentioned, typically... Uh, a strategic will look at that, you know, a large company will look at that data and say, well, we have the sales channel. We'll just acquire this now, uh, essentially on PMA approval. And then those companies don't ever have to build out, you know, the commercial teams, et cetera. The opposite with kind of the 510K route, getting into the market. I think a lot of entrepreneurs think that getting the 510K and getting through the FDA is the finish line. And it actually turns out to be the starting line. And so that's, that's kind of the, 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 you know, the trick is that you get through the technology development, you get through regulatory, but then you've just begun commercially. And for a unknown device, especially an unknown implant that does not have clinical data, you can't say it's better than standard of care yet. You know, that's, 
that's challenging. And so you're going to have to spend money to build that market. And you do that both with people, uh, you do that with medical education, and, and hopefully you do that with results. Anecdotal at first, uh, surgeon A, B, and C, you know, have a good experience. They give some testimonials. But further down the track, you got to build out that evidence. Oh, no, totally. Can you talk through like um, – so real quick, I just want to make sure that, that the audience doesn't sure. understand. The big differentiator for BioBrace was that you guys were taking two – well-known approaches and just combining them in terms of scaffolding. Is that correct? Yeah. So uh, in the, in the sports market, kind of circa 2017, 2018, you had rotation medical. Now it was acquired by Smith and nephew in 2017. Uh, that's the Regenitin implant, which is a bioinductive patch to augment rotator cuff healing. Essentially this little collagen patch that's, that's delicate handling properties can increase thickness after it's implanted. So you can actually encourage the patient to heal a thicker tendon and they've gone on to their credit to show that that reduces retear rates. So you actually have better clinical outcomes if you use this patch. Uh, but the, the implant itself had no mechanical durability or capacity for load sharing. The market leader, Arthrex, uh, is marketing, was marketing, is still marketing to this day, a technology called internal brace, which is essentially a piece of suture tape for a mechanical backstop. And so what was very interesting when we came on the scene is that you had, on one hand, you know, market leader number one, regenerative patch with no mechanical durability market leader number two mechanical durability no healing you know potential so we wanted to combine both we wanted to provide the first scaffold that could be both mechanical as well as uh, a bioinductive patch to regenerate um, new tissue new thicker tendon nice nice so what when you guys got started commercially uh, you know, early adopters are so important. How did you find those early adopters? Because they, they essentially shortcut your way to other early adopters and that drives mass adoption over time. How did you find those early adopters? What did you guys do from a commercial standpoint, both sales and marketing? Um, like if you had to, sure. to go back and identify like two or three main levers, what were they? Well, I think the first thing uh, is you have to get started way, way, way before you go commercial. So, you know, years before yeah. we were commercial, <laughs> Um, we had put together a surgeon advisory board that participated in design development, um, you know, the testing of it, the animal studies, the results. So, you know, not only did that allow us to get their valuable input on the process, understanding what the market really wanted, but it also created trust uh, in the data and in the product so that we had some champions, you know, when we did launch. And these were surgeons that when we came out on the market felt comfortable and ready to use the product clinically. So that was really, really important. Um, another, I think, important piece is uh, hiring in the right people. So, you know, I was a first time CEO, first time founder, uh, no commercial experience in sports medicine. So I brought in um, David Hook, uh, who did a very nice job as our vice president of sales, who had a very good network. Uh, he was formerly with Rotation Medical. Um, so. It was a pretty easy story to say, hey, you know, we have now people, David Hook in particular, uh, from Rotation Medical. We had a Generation 1 patch, and that's a great product. Uh, we've made some improvements to that, and here's a Generation 2 product. And actually, a little bit further down the track, uh, we hired some, form some additional former people from Rotation Medical, including their Director of Clinical Studies uh, in Jeff Grebner, who's doing a wonderful job, you know, on the clinical side. So kind of once we got going, we wanted to bring in people that – had done it before, and that was a really nice um, example in the market. So definitely need to get started early. Definitely need to bring in people that have done it before. Nice. On, on in terms of bringing people who have done it before, you know, recruiting is always really tough. Um, who are some of the key hires that you made in like it, in the future? I mean, you're a young guy, so I'm going to assume that you know sure. you got that you got the entrepreneurial bug. So it's only a matter of time before you decide like something else to do. I saw, by the way, you have a. You, you are the founder of an interesting uh, dog boarding and uh, like uh, <laughs> uh, like uh, Paw, Paw Haven, Connecticut. I love it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we have a, I have a dog boarding, uh, dog boarding and daycare business. The only dog boarding it. and daycare business in New Haven, Connecticut. You should give us a uh, seriously. They actually have a very good Instagram. Give, yeah. Give it a give it a look on the Instagram. Uh, I definitely Haven, will. CT. But in terms of like the key hires, who are some of the key hires? I mean, you don't have to if you want to mention them by name, feel free to. But like position wise that you look back as an entrepreneur, as a med tech entrepreneur and say like, those are really important. And then if you, you know, you do it again in the future, would that still same be the same thing? Yeah. So I think at a high level, you need to know 
you know, what you're good at, strengths and weaknesses, whatever. Obviously, uh, first time founder, first time CEO, um, there were the majority of things I had never done. So mm -hmm. pretty much across every, every functional category, whether it's regulatory, whether it's intellectual property, whether it's sales, whether it's marketing, whether it's finance, I basically went out and tried to find somebody that was good at that. Mm -hmm. And uh, doing that through, it, same with the board of directors, you know, getting, getting a quality board of directors that could actually add value and help introduce me to some of those people, people that have been there, done that. So <clears throat> I think looking back on it, it's easy to say now, you know, at the time, everything just feels like chaos and you're running a million miles an hour. But when I look back, um, I feel very fortunate that we, we were able to recruit um, uh, just a number of great people in each of those verticals. And I really think that, you know, person in vertical A may think that they're more important than vertical B, but we really needed all of these different people. And there's, you know, there's actually dozens of people that I think without maybe any of them, maybe it doesn't fall apart, but it's risk of falling apart is much higher. Yeah. Yeah, no, well said. And I think, you know, to be honest with you, I think like this is like the more I've gotten to know you and just even on this on this uh, episode, I think this is the reason why you often don't see the original inventor or founder continue on as a CEO. And I think it's because when you have a, te whether it's a technical founder or a lot of times like a physician founder, um, being an engineer, being a physician, those are really difficult roles. The problem, though, is that you come under this illusion that like what you do is so difficult that everything else, sales, marketing, recruiting, whatever, is probably easy and you can do it. And a lot of times technical founders end up having this illusion that they think they're Steve Jobs and they can do it all and they're not. And it sounds like you were very radically transparent with yourself in your um, in the gaps you had and then just went and filled those gaps by recruiting top talent. It, would, would you agree with that? Well, I think so. I also just felt desperate. You know, it's like, like I can't do this <laughs> that on my helped. own. You know, it's like somebody help me. You know, my God, I signed up all these investors to do this crazy project. And I feel um, a little bit sick to my stomach that we have to try to make this work. Um, who, who, who are the investors? I got to ask, like every CEO has like that one board member that kind of is like almost like a like a paternal or maternal figure like somebody like you're like man that's the one person i was i'm able i'm able to go to and lean on like in tough times Who who's that board member or investor i'm not um we didn't have the most diverse board i'll, I'll say that you know up front here but the the board that we, we put together i think was was really strong and i did i did go to them frequently um nick Pachuto, who i think you know um paul hermes uh, some of my investors, Dan Wagner from Connecticut Innovations, uh, Dick Emmett from the Vertical Group. So I had a balance of kind of med device executives as well as um, investors. But but one guy in particular that was that really helped transform BioRes, and I think that the BioBrace um, uh, in particular may not be here without would be Sasha Levy from the New York Angels. And he was actually a new investor in kind of 2017, 2018. So that he wasn't he wasn't an original investor. And when he came in and he started to hear more about this bio brace versus the legacy technology, he was so excited about it because he was looking at it fresh. I mean, he didn't have baggage. He didn't have history. He was a new investor. And he ended up uh, leading the New York Angels. The New York Angels then led a financing to essentially pursue the pivot. And that's what really helped make that pivot possible. And so it's kind of like a little behind the, behind the scenes that no one, you know, that probably get lost in the sands of time. But it was really interesting to see him say, that's it. That's the winner. Like, you guys got to push on that. And in the end, you know, he was right. That's amazing. And it's always exciting to hear. Because, again, that's part of the reason why I have this show is, like, there's these stories that, like, you know, they get forgotten over time. And I just, you know, like, I wish a podcast or some version of it existed back in the days of U.S. Surgical. Like, I would, sure. I would pay a lot of money. I mean, there's a part of me where I want to make money through this podcast and, like, go – commission a documentary or possible movie for like intuitive and us surgery like that i'd pay to see that you know um sure. well oh, and, here's, and here's the best part i mean i mean here's the best part you know when you're you know when you're the ceo you are in the crosshairs of everybody like nobody's on your team and everybody wants to give you their input and so you're trying to always filter like what input do i agree with what does it matter and, and you're never going to make everybody happy so you're always trying to like either compromise or go with your gut or go with what makes sense to you but from an investor standpoint, what was really interesting for Sasha in particular with the New York Angels is he put his money where his mouth is. He literally put his own money and he put the money on the table and said, if we go this route, here's what I'm going to invest. 
and everyone else went, okay, <laughs> you know, like That's we are now following you. He is, he is the, now the financial leader and he made the bet and he was right. And now he's been rewarded, you know, handsomely. So, you know, credit to him. That's that's amazing, and I love I love hearing um I love hearing about like you know people who just go f like you know they're all in, and he he sounds like he was all yeah. in. Yeah, we were we were both all in big time. So uh, you know we we have that kind of special bond, and and as an entrepreneur that's out there maybe listening to that, I mean you, you gotta you gotta really be all in because it's it's not going to happen through delegation. That's amazing. Um, what were some of the big like challenges like? I know that I, look every day, every week in a startup is a challenge. I always tell people, especially ones who leave J and J or Medtronic, they're going to go into startup and they're like, "Oh yeah, it's like the movies." I'm like it's terrible, actually. <laughs> it's kind of like you got to you got to get used to going <laughs> to bed with like multiple multiple fires going on. Um, so, oh, can you still hear me? Yeah. So, I mean, sort of, what is it like? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I think I think you have to be a certain comfort level with uncertainty, right? Um, the name of the game in startups is risk, right? It's the whole, the whole thing is an exercise. The whole game is an exercise in mitigating and managing risk. And I think at the beginning of a startup, you have risk everywhere, right? And as you spend dollars, you know, the CEO, founder, and, and even, you know, the management team, they need to look at every dollar they're spending and think about how are they making this thing less risky, um, and the further you get out, hopefully you're converting dollars into a company that both builds value, but also lowers risk. And so in the beginning, you know, there's a lot of technical risk. And so obviously we're going to be, especially as a technical founder with a team of engineers, we're going to be really focused on de-risking the technology. Um, that then, trans, you know, that then becomes more of a regulatory risk. You know, what if the process with the FDA doesn't go well? What if we you know, don't, aren't able to get this approved. And then that turns into obviously commercial risk. And there's, there's a lot of risk at every stage and you have to be able to identify what the risks are and you have to try to figure out how to mitigate it. And if that all sounds, you know, overwhelming, um, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely not for everybody, but uh, I think for startup people, you know, they thrive in that because you control your own destiny and that's a little bit fun, um, but also very exciting. No, I, I completely, completely agree. And it's funny, um, you know, since I made my own transition from like being a startup guy to starting my own own business, um, I've just realized like there's a lot of things that you take for granted in terms of the personality and psychology you develop in the startup and then transitions to small business in terms of like just, you know, like early days of me starting the business, like there are times where like I, I had like a negative balance in my bank account. I'm like, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it a way through. We'll be fine. You know, you, you just have to get used to that. Like, I think most people, they, they, you know, like they underestimate that. What was, if you go back, what was the most challenging time during the bioRes days that you look back and you're like, that was the, that was the moment that we made it through and we became bioRes. Like, what was that? What was that moment or time period? What did you learn? What's your advice to other founders? Yeah, it was it was probably that pivot time where not only not only, you know, had I raised money to do X and now I was sort of proposing Y, you know, going in a different direction. Um, we also were almost out of money, which is never a good time to pivot. I mean, if you're going to. That's pivot, actually, yeah, it's almost like the worst time. Like, but you know what? It's, it's the worst time. I, I, but, you know, it in a way it kind of worked out because you made that pivot. And if you had money, maybe you wouldn't have gone as hard into it. Maybe, I mean, you, 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 you acted with a lot of intention and took radical action during that pivot. I would imagine like you and the team. We, we did. And, um, and I think we also had to have focus, right? Like we couldn't kind of go, we were so small and so scrappy and had such little money. It's like, we're not going to develop both of these products in parallel. There's just no way. Um, but yeah, I think that was, that was pretty risky. And I think if you were to, go back in time and candidly ask some of my investors, you know, not all of them agreed with my decision and probably some of them thought that I needed to go. You know, I was probably, my head was on the chopping block um, because, you know, we had, they had been a participant of a startup that failed. $13 million went into it, went to zero. I said, hey, let's put some more money in and, and make it better, which we did. And then two years later, I said, hey, I know it went better and I know we restarted, but you know what we should do? We should go in a different direction. I think some people at that point are like, you know, throw in the towel, can this kid, let's, you know, let's just sell this thing. And, um, why you know, didn't we, they we do that? Through. Why didn't they do that? Well, because, because the, the most powerful thing that you can do, I think as a CEO is go raise money. 
um, if you raise money for your vision, you can go do that thing within, you know, within reason, you know, with the support of the investors. But if you have, you know, the cash is king, right? So if you have investors that want to fund the project and even continue funding the project, uh, you can keep on going. And, and you look at, you know, you look at the polar opposite, you know, this is kind of a bad story, but you look at like Theranos, uh, people in my network know I bring this up a lot. I mean, she, you know, Elizabeth Holmes was able to kind of keep going down this crazy path, spending tons and tons of money because she was able to raise the money to do that. In a normal checks and balances, good governance, like you can never go that far, get that far off the rails. Um, but if you can raise the money, you can keep going. And if you can keep going, you can iterate and you can pivot and you can, you know, if you start by going to uh, the moon or going to orbit, you know, if you keep going, you can then eventually get to Mars and go kind of bigger and bigger. And so you see, you see a lot of entrepreneurs do that. But if you can't raise the money, then probably your days as CEO are limited. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. I, um, I want to get to, um, you know, there's a there's an entrepreneur I met a long time ago named Jonathan Taylor. And I think the um, he's had a few exits. And if you combine all the exits, it might have been like to an amount of two, two, two or two and a half billion. And the one thing he said that always stuck with me, he said that what made him different was that from day one of the company, he was spending more time thinking about the last days of the company. And the reason why he said that was that one of his exits, when they started negotiations, the valuation of the company was like uh, three or $400 million. Let's just say it's 400 mil. And six months later, by the time they finished negotiations and it got acquired, the valuation of the company was uh, up to like 650 or 700. So his point was like, he added more value to the company in those six months of negotiation then the entire two or three years of the company had been uh, uh, fun functioning. Again, I want to be respectful to comment and everything, but like, what can you tell us about what that was like in terms of, you know, when you were talking to comment, I'm sure you were talking to other, other companies, I assume. Um, give us a little behind the curtain in terms of what that was like and what advice you have. Sure. Yeah. So for people that are startup curious or for the entrepreneurs that are out there actually running startups, um, things have to happen uh, as you start to run out of money. You know, either you raise a new round, uh, Series C, Series A, Series B, Series C. You see the people kind of make those announcements and they celebrate how much money companies have raised, uh, or companies go under and they fail to raise that money and they just go away, um, or you know they can sell. And so, kind of at every you know every few months, you have an opportunity to kind of look at all your options and. BioRes had successfully launched the BioBrace in April of 2021. We, our plan was to, we actually did a financing round to, to get us out one full year post FDA clearance so that we could actually um, measure early adopters sort of sales, uh, see some early clinical data. Uh, you know, going back to Scott Sigmund, he had one of the first post-op MRIs of a patient at three months showing that the tendon got thicker. So we actually were able to de-risk the company and generate a lot of value in that 12 month period. So we raised a round of money just to do that, knowing that at the end of that round, we were going to raise a big round. And the big round was going to be 50, about $15 million. And that was going to uh, let us build a commercial channel, actually go out and hire the reps and hire the mark sales marketing team, you know, the whole thing. We were really uh, in a limited market uh, release prior to that. Um, you know, David Hook hiring a team, Pat Helfrich, the marketing really small, really lean, just getting it out there. And so we got to that stage where it's, hey, look, you know, let's go raise the 15 million. We had a number of investors. We had a few term sheets. Uh, and then we were also talking to the strategics. And I was actually kind of full disclosure. It's okay to share this part. Um, I thought it would be great for $15 million. Okay, well, we'll get 5 million from our existing investors. We'll get 5 million from like a new lead investor, let's call it a new investor. And we'll get 5 million from you know, a strategic, uh, you know, any of the large companies. And then that way they have a little skin in the game. We start to do a little partnership and then maybe hopefully, you know, two years later, they'll actually acquire us. And so I was talking to all of the companies about that. And some of the companies were very, very interested and, you know, ConMed to their credit, uh, started to go down the diligence process for an investment. And I think, uh, you know, speaking for them, I think they liked what they saw and they started to realize that potentially if, if they were to make an investment and let this company go on and become this bigger company, either they're going to have to pay, spend a lot more money in the future to get it, 
or worst case, they actually get outbid in the future to one of their competitors. So they realize to their credit that the best thing to do would be actually acquire us now. And so they, they pivoted on me in our diligence process uh, into an acquisition. And so we, we spent, um, you know, whatever, 60 days, 75 days, uh, kind of hammering out the, the definitive deal. And we were able to get it done last summer. That's amazing. When, when that happened, you know, what, um, again, and you can, you can say pass, you know, you don't have to answer these questions. Sure. Like, sure. What do you, when you, when you went back to the board and said, Hey, you know, I know we're, we're doing a raise right now, but ConMed actually is interested in acquiring us. Was it kind of like, hell yeah, let's like, like, let's get this over the line. Was it like, maybe let's see. I mean, what, what, what was that like, you know? And how, how did you, how did yeah. you make the decision? Yeah. So, um, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, as your question sort of implies, I mean, obviously the first thing I do as the CEO, you know, as the CEO, you, you're the figurehead of the company, but you don't unilaterally, you don't control the whole company. So any kind of written offer like that, you know, of course you bring it to the board of directors and you just discuss it with the board and you have to decide, you know, you have a bit of a, you have a fiduciary responsibility to all of your shareholders, whether they're on the board or whether it's the first check in or whether it's, you know, the smallest check, uh, you kind of have that obligation as a board member to evaluate it, you know, what's best for them. And so what I was amazed by was I went into that thinking, okay, these, a lot of these investors have put in a lot of money and they put in a lot of money a long time ago. I think they're going to really pressure me into selling the company and, and maybe I don't want to do that. And I was really blown away that they were really interested to hear what did I want to do, and I wasn't expecting that. That's and, great. And yeah, that's, that I'm not, I wasn't expecting you to tell me that either. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's not it's not what I expected, and and so you know they really leaned on me to to give them a recommendation of what kind of we should do, and obviously they gave me input. Um, and then I say it, you know, after um, some deliberation, you know, we decided to take it to the next stage. And and by the way, you know, just because you have a a term sheet, you know, with anybody, whether it's an investment round or whether it's a, uh, you know, letter of intent for an acquisition, it's a long way from getting done. So, That's right. <laughs> so, even, so even though, even though we sort of say in our, you know, in a closed room, okay, you know, let's go forward with this. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't keep exploring, you know, your alternatives or, um, you know, be prepared for that not to go through. And so we were prepared in the event that didn't go through uh, because that just really only built our confidence that, at some point in the near future, somebody is really going to want this. Yeah. And, and that's really exciting to hear when, when you decided to like, uh, commence like the negotiations and everything, did you, um, like in that period were you able to add more value? Was it kind of, did it meet like, you know, like, uh, you know, did anything, did anything change during that 60 day period, right? That moving forward in the future, if you start another company, you do anything, you're like, I need to make sure I do that again or don't do that. Oh. You know? <clears throat> Yeah, look, the M&A process, and there, there are people that, you know, only do that, right? Investment bankers, lawyers, uh, it was it was really interesting, you know, as, as we continued on, the people involved just grew, we just, you know, we started with two lawyers became five lawyers became, you know, eight lawyers, it's like, you know, the bankers teams grew. Uh, and, and I have a lot of respect uh, for that whole ecosystem, the whole M&A process, it is a grind. And you're negotiating absolutely every point. And there's a lot of stuff. I mean, people fixate on, you know, the deal value, the total value up to $250 million. But there's so many small points about, you know, how is that going to happen? And, and in an earnout in particular, you know, you're negotiating, how are you going to count sales in the future? And, you know, what sort of how does it all actually work? And then what are all the doomsday scenarios? You know, what if, what if ConMed is acquired? What if, you know, ConMed goes bankrupt? What, if, you know, just crazy things. And you kind of have to think about all these different um, hypotheticals, almost like, like you got your insurance hat on, just thinking about all these different types of insurances and indemnifications and things like that. So um, yes, you know, if you do your job well, uh, you add some value or you take some risk out for your shareholders. Uh, but there's also a lot of value in getting the deal done. And so it was a balancing act of, how hard do you push? Um, and then how do you just not blow it all apart? And so I think that that ConMed did a great, you know, they ran a great process with Pete Shigori, you know, in the business development. Um, you know, the name of ConMed is short for Consolidated Medical. So they have a history of I didn't know acquiring that. and yeah, 
Yeah, I, I was hoping it was Connecticut Medical because uh, you know I'm here in Connecticut, but it's actually Consolidated Medical. Um, but yeah, that's that's really the, the the legacy and origin of of the company. And so you know, their one of their core competencies is is running that process. And I thought that they ran you know a fair, objective process. So you know, I would encourage entrepreneurs that are out there. Uh, with companies, you know, to, to reach out to ConMed, or if you can't, don't know who to reach out to, you know, reach out to me and feel free to look me up on LinkedIn. Oh, absolutely. And on a separate note, I have to send you a text. I, I would love to get one of the more like seasoned M&A people from ConMed to kind of talk about what that yeah. was like, because it's, it's very much he closed doors. I think a lot in. of people are interested. I know that like a lot of the M&A guys and biz dev guys at like a Baxter Medtronic have sent me messages like, oh, you should get some more M&A stuff on. I'm like, yeah, like, I don't know who to talk yeah. to though. You know, well, well, I, I know some people that you can, um, we can maybe get them in and they can say how full of shit I am, you know, and that I lied <laughs> on here, you know, like, <laughs> or, or they could say about how, you know, how horrible I was during the process. Cause you do, you do sort of hit each other, you know, you sort of hit each other with bats for like, you know, eight weeks across the face. And then, and then it's funny <laughs> at the end of it, you say, at the end of it, you say, okay, great. Well, now we're actually on the same team. You're colleagues. I'm a full-time employee at Conmit. So, you know, you kind of like hug it out and you move on. That's amazing. Any um, going back and and again, I, I, I'm happy. You know, it's like really late over there, so we'll wrap it up in a little bit. But just um, sure. any any regrets if you go back, like during that process and everything. Anything that you were like, man, I kind of wish I did that differently. You know, I mean, there's of course. I mean, you know, it's like it's so easy to be the mon Monday morning quarterback, right? Um, you know, did we tell? Did we sell too soon? Did we sell for too little? Did we? Um, should we have taken the BioBrace as our first foray into commercialized tissue engineered products for sports medicine and go after other things like meniscus or cartilage? Or, you know, should we have gone back to what we put on the shelf with, you know, an ACL graft replacement? If we don't do the ACL graft replacement or if we sell to ConMed, will that ever happen? You know, does, 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 you know, how do we, how do we kind of keep it going? Uh, if we sell the company. And so that's, you know, you, you grapple, I grappled with things like that and more. And I think for maybe people listening to this, they'll say, you're full of shit. You sold the company for all that money. Um, but, but it is, it is hard. You know, you create a company, you spend a long time, you put all your blood, sweat and tears into it. Um, you know, it's cliche, but it is like kind of raising a baby and, and to kind of sell it off is, is not easy. Um, you know, maybe, maybe for the, uh, for the other folks, you know, if they're interested, uh, who do, do sell the companies and you know, maybe you do like a little like postpartum, uh, depression club or something, you know, to just like support each other. Yeah, you, dude, like, that's what this part, just send them this way. This is what this show's for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, it's, 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 it's really been, um, it's good. I don't have any major regrets. I'm super proud of obviously what the team, you know, what the team did, I, I, you know, one of the things that, that goes, people obviously gravitate a little bit towards me because I was the CEO. I get to be out in front. I get to do some podcasts. But, you know, the we had a young, smart, dynamic team, you know, at BioRes. I'm really, really proud of them. Uh, to this day, they're, you know, they're hard at work uh, with ConMed, trying to scale this thing up, trying to generate the evidence, trying to bring it to a, you know, a hospital near you. And, um, yeah, you know, they, they really deserve uh, all the recognition. I was just really lucky to be, you know, the guy that gets to get up on stage and talk about it. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, look, just to kind of, you know, in wrapping up, I have a few like sort of somewhat rapid fire questions. Um, the okay. first one's not so rapid fire. It might take you a second, but, um, you know, kind of looking back, um, you know, especially being a CEO and a first time CEO, you're going to be told like some pretty, you know, hard things that are going to hurt. Um, what was something uh, that you were told, whether it was by an employee, a mentor, a board member or something that that was really painful for you? but it, it forced you to change for the better. Well, who was that person? What did they tell you? Oh, interesting. Um, tough question. Wow. Put me on the spot here at the yeah. lightning round. Um, I, I had somebody, I had somebody at a large company at a relatively high position, pull me aside after a meeting where we were, we were talking about, you know, strategic partnerships. And this person said some negative things to me and they said, Hey, you know, here's some unsolicited advice. And it was it was actually pretty um, offensive to me. It was, this was when you were at Bi at BioRes. Yeah, yeah, I was the C. I was the C. I was the CEO of BioRes, and I was interested in partnering with this large company. And we were trying to figure out, you know, a way for that to happen. And kind of one of the one of the more senior people afterwards. And I think I, I sort of it was hard for me to digest. Like, where is this coming from? You know, I've never done anything to you know say anything bad about this company and and anything else. And I think that they maybe had a technology that they 
um, you know, that's competitive to us. And I think that it, maybe it concerned them. And I was just, I was blown away because I, I, I feel um, this ecosystem is small. And I think that, you know, we should all sort of help each other. And like, I, like I don't have any ill will against any of these companies or any of these people. And I was surprised that someone would interpret what, whatever I was doing or whatever I was saying as something negative. And they were sort of telling me to cut it out. And, what did um, they exactly so that's, tell that's, you? Sorry, not to poke, but I gotta. Oh yeah, yeah, no, no. It was. I, I think it was just maybe I had made a comment in a public talk about you know their technology, and they just did not like me saying anything about what they were doing, and they sort of said, you know, shut up. And I was just, um, I, I was surprised by that. So it is a good lesson, though. You know, this is this being this podcast is probably a good forum to hear it. You know, people should remember uh, that their words matter, and and communicating effectively. Um, and safely and diplomatically is its own discipline. And that takes, you know, you're going to mess up, you're going to fall on your face uh, a number of times. I certainly did, but there is a skill to that and don't underestimate that skill. Yeah, no, it's, it's funny you say that, especially me being such a public figure with the podcast, the Instagram and everything, like you're going to mess up. And sometimes it's, it's always good just to be hyper aware of that and take it in. And it's good that you took that in and, and took it as a lesson versus most people I think would have just been upset or offended by it and be like, you know, screw that I, guy. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I mean, I think I apologize. I said, look, I don't, I don't know what you're referring to, but you know, for what it's worth, I'm, I didn't intend it and I'm sorry. Uh, but you know, if you got to know me better, maybe you'd feel differently and uh, let's just move on, you know? Yeah. I will say though, um, I think it's a good lesson just on a side note, our industry is like, hyper hyper aggressive and like close cloak conservative like about a lot of things like i've gotten messages about things i talk about on this podcast like unrelated to companies who are like oh you shouldn't talk about them like says who you know so there's something about our industry yeah. they're just like very they're very possessive and they want to like control people like the way they talk and what they say and everything so anyway that's a that's a whole other thing so now we'll do real rapid fire um Okay. I'm sure. I'm sure during this time you've you've been talk, you know, reached out to by other founders and everything. Um, is there a book that you you recommend or gift most often to other founders or entrepreneurs? Ooh, um, yes. I, so I'm a frequent. I, I do Audible. Uh, I can't read at night because I'll just fall asleep like instantly. Uh, but when I am running around, you know, through airports, planes, trains, automobiles, like I do listen to a lot of nonfiction, um, some podcasts, I'm getting a little bit more into it. Um, but yes, there are great books out there. Just, I mean, if you want a fun read, you know, I mentioned Elizabeth Holm and Theranos. I mean, Bad Blood by John Carreyrou from the Wall Street Journal was an amazing book. Uh, that's that's not quite educational, but it's it's certainly entertaining. And there's lessons in there. Not, actually, which not what not to do. <laughs> um, yeah, but if your goal is to raise money, it also tells you a little bit about what you can do and that's a you great know, how point. you. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, um, so and, and you know maybe a polar opposite of me. You know, I, I really focused on making the technology work. You know, she focused really on her image and her you know her persona and her marketing, and so it's sort of a tale of two cities a little bit for me to read that book. That's a great book. Look, there's a, there's, there's a ton. I could maybe send you a note afterwards. You want to put them in the show notes. I can, I can give it a little bit better thought. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And then, um, like last, last one again, kind of a, kind of a fun, especially, you know, you're, you're, you're engineer. So I, I hope you have a, you have something, but like, um, you know, pandemic times, this, this was a pandemic question I used to ask, and now it's just sure. become part of the show. Um, what's a really cool buy you've, gotten from amazon in the last like year or two some really <laughs> cool gadget or product you know i always tell people try and make it under 100 bucks but something something really really cool and unique oh man uh you're really catching me off so so to work related like to make anything more efficient anything. Oh, oh anything well anything. well look we were talking so i'm gonna i'm gonna go ahead i'm gonna go out on a limb here and i'm, I'm gonna go ahead and say uh i have gotten into golf as a part of covid um and we were talking a little bit about it and I think there's a great opportunity to uh, kind of go out for four or five hours, play around to golf uh, and talk some business with interesting people. And so I've, I've tried to now mix a little bit of golf with a little bit of um, business. And, and I think, you know, we got to get out there sometime. But, you know, surgeons, a lot of surgeons are very good golfers. A lot of reps are very good golfers. You know, we've been to a number of meetings that have a golf function. So if anybody's kind of thinking about, oh, you know, hey, I'm looking for a hobby. Um, I've actually found it very interesting, very fun, and also very humbling because it's incredibly hard. And uh, it's nothing quite like going out there and embarrassing yourself in front of important people. Oh, no, 100%. And yeah, again, like 
you know, <laughs> at, at LSI this past year, you and, uh, they had the, uh, Friday golf tournament and I missed out on that and I wasn't playing and you were kind of a big reason, like where I was like, you know, maybe I should take up golf and I, man, I love it now. So we're definitely going to be playing, um, uh, very, very soon. But Kevin, with that being said, like, definitely we're going to have to have you back on. Uh, thanks for like kind of, you know, jamming this, you know, at the end of the day, it was really insightful. Um, in the meantime though, where, where can people find you online? Yeah, I'm, I'm super basic. Uh, I would say find me on LinkedIn, just, you know, backslash Kevin Rocco. Uh, I'm not a TikToker. I'm not a, really an Instagram or anything like that, but um, I'm happy to respond to people on LinkedIn if, if you're interested in the story. And um, if I can be helpful, you know, reach out, especially for, you know, the other founders that are out there uh, trying to make it. So um, we all need to kind of help each other. And Omar, you know, congratulations on the show. It's been really fantastic to watch your own startup journey progress. And now you've got 35,000 followers in this amazing podcast and you seem to be at all these conferences. So, you know, congrats to you on your own uh, success. Thanks, man. It's, a, it's an awesome industry. And, you know, my, my big mission was just like, I just wanted a platform to make, make our stories like more well-known and everything. I can't take seeing more talented people go and work at some stupid, like, I don't know, social media company, and everything. Like what we do is really amazing. It saves lives. And so if there's a way that I can make our industry just really cool and awesome and exciting then awesome you know more more power for it so but hey man thanks for the compliment i really appreciate it so with that being yeah, said, really be sure well to said. Check, oh totally man so with that being said be sure to give kevin a follow on linkedin this has been another episode of the state of medtech don't forget subscribe to the show give us five stars write a review we're the number one show for a reason and it's probably because i keep reminding you guys to do this so we'll see you all next time <laughs> bye for now <laughs>